Hello again. I'm still Bob McRite. I'm director of the Office of Technology Development. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about what's patentable and what's not. And uh, I think you'll find it's an interesting, uh, interesting set of guidelines that have been created over the years and uh, somewhat different than the way you might think about uh, things in your world in the laboratory. Um, the answer to the question of what's patentable and what's not is steeped in history. It was uh, patent laws first appeared in Venice in uh, 1474. These are patents for, um, uh, for inventions I'm talking about. There were patents earlier than that that related to shipping and commerce. Um, the English uh, Patent Act of 1624 was regarded as ex particularly successful, and the French followed in 1844. Um, in the Continental Congress of 1787, there was a considerable debate as to whether patents should be provided for by the, under the US Constitution. And uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, argued uh, pretty vigorously in correspondence with James Madison as to why he thought patents should not be provided. He thought that any kind of a monopoly was abhorrent to free commerce, and he also thought that ideas should be free to all. Um, but ultimately, um, the impact of the patent system in, in England by that time had become so well regarded that uh, luckily for us, Jefferson lost that argument. In one of, one of history's great ironies, uh, oh, uh, so it wound up being in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8. Now, Article 1 of the Constitution lists all of the powers of con Congress most notoriously the power to tax and spend. Um, but it also provides that Congress shall have the power to promote, promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Uh, the idea of securing for limited times was largely because of Jefferson in that uh, in England at that time, patents lasted indefinitely. And uh, Jefferson argued very vigorously that it should only last for a limited time. And the suggestion at the time was that patents should last for, t for 14 years, which was considered equal to two cycles of apprenticeship in most trades. The Patent Act of 1790 resulted uh, from, uh, from the power that was granted the Constitution. And it said that you can patent any useful art, manufacture, engine, machine, or device, or any improvement therein not before known or used. Uh, as we look at the modern laws, you will see many of these same words follow through. Uh, and it also said that the invention must be sufficiently useful and important. And how you decide whether an invention is important or not uh, was something over which there was a great deal of uncertainty for some time. Um, in one of the great ironies in uh, American history, Thomas Jefferson wound up being the first patent examiner. And the reason is that he was the first Secretary of State under George Washington, and the Patent Act of 1790 said that the Secretary of State would be the patent examiner. And the photograph here is of patent number one, which issued in 1790, and it was a patent on a method of making potash, which is an important ingredient in gunpowder. And you can see it's signed by none other than George Washington. Uh, Thomas Jefferson set down some strict rules. Um, and in a way, he was gratified that he had uh, the ability to decide what those rules might be, uh, because he felt that it was important that inventions only be granted for things that are truly important. And so his rule was that um, he wouldn't allow a patent for something that was merely a new application for an old invention. And uh, he wouldn't grant a patent for an old invention that was made with a new material. And that he wouldn't grant a patent for mere combinations of old inventions. And ultimately, uh, fewer than half of the patent applications that he reviewed were, were issued. Uh, he was the patent uh, commission at the time was himself uh, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of War. And the three of them would get together and decide which patent should be issued. Um, uh, the uh, historical development uh, 
uh, was that ultimately the Patent Act of 1790 was replaced by the Patent Act of 1793, which provided for there to be a separate uh, office of patents that would handle patent applications and had a separate commissioner because it was just too much for the Secretary of State. And oddly, the Patent Act of 1793 said, anything you write a patent application on is patentable. And basically, anything that came in the door was issued as a patent. Well, that was all well and good until patent owners started suing each other. And the clog of patent litigation wound, that wound up in the courts led to the uh, Patent Act of 18, um, 1863, in which uh, patent examining was once again introduced. Um, the modern requirements, the Patent Act, uh, the Patent Act of 1863, was really the foundation for our modern laws. It was ultimately um, re reworded significantly in 1953, and then just this year, or just in 2011. Uh, there was a new patent invents, American Invents Act that's made some important changes. Uh, but the modern requirements are still the same for patentability. First of all, the invention must be patentable subject matter. Secondly, it must have a use. It must be useful. A third, it must be novel. That is, it was something that wasn't already known. It had to be non-obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art. You had to provide a substantial written description that it would enable someone to carry out the invention. Uh, but let's go and talk about each one of these uh, requirements, because all of them uh, have a great deal of uh, history and uh, complexity to them. So the requirement for patentable subject matter is described in the United States Code, which is the United States Code, all of the laws that Congress passes. and uh, Title 35 is all about patents. And Section 101 describes what inventions are patentable. And it says, whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof, may obtain a patent, therefore, subject to the conditions and requirements of the remainder of Section 35. Anybody know what this uh, picture might be of? It's Eli Whitney's cotton gin, which revolutionized the textile industry in America, making it far easier to harvest cotton from cotton crops. Um, I'll show you some examples of patentable subject matter. This picture on the left is probably one of the most important inventions uh, in the uh, 1800s. It was patented in 1861 by Otis, and it's a, a, um, an elevator device that allows, makes it shoot assures that the elevator can't fall down the elevator shaft if the rope breaks. And prior to this invention, uh, in New York City, there was always reports of people who had died in uh, elevator accidents where the rope wore through and, uh, and they fell to their death. Well, Otis had a great idea, and what he did was, I think there's a point right here. If you see right here, this is where the rope attaches, and this is a leaf spring here. When you pull up on the, when the weight of the car pulls up on the leaf spring, it pulls these little arms away from the notches in the wall of the elevator. So if the, if the rope should break, the leaf spring will then extend itself and these notches go into the, these uh, little arms go into the notches in the side of the elevator and stop it from falling. And it, essentially the same mechanism is still in use today. Um, so uh, a number of examples of kinds of things that are considered patentable subject matter. You can have a process or method. And uh, there's a very famous patent dispute over a method of making cookies. I don't know if you remember the Toll House soft batch cookies where they came out of the bag and they were kind of soft just like they came out of the oven. And Nabisco and General Foods had a huge patent lawsuit over it and ultimately uh, it was found unpatentable um, because of a 1952 recipe in a German cookbook that described the same process. You can have a method of treating a disease by administering a particular drug or kind of drug. You have a method of sequencing DNA. DNA. These all would be patentable. 
Um, machines, I think most of us recognize are patentable. You, like a pinball machine, a tractor, a laser knife for using surgery, a food processor, or of course a sewing machine. And uh, during the Industrial Revolution, there were thousands and thousands of patents on sewing machines. Uh, many, and the most successful one was owned by Singer. And the success of the Singer sewing machine was not so much because their sewing machine mechanism was better than anybody else. Anybody know why the Singer sewing machine became uh, so incredibly successful? It's the very first consumer product ever marketed to women. Uh, they, uh, sewing machines previously had always been sold to men. They were considered uh, industrial machinery and, you know, you would buy it along with your tractors and combines. And uh, Singer got the great idea of saying, well, how about if we make them pretty? We put fancy painting scrolls on them and uh, sell them to women. Well, the problem was women didn't have any money because the men had all the money. And so what uh, Singer also invented was uh, revolving credit. And they said most women at that time had 10 cents of disposable income a week. And so they said, you know, we'll sell you the sewing machine for 10 cents a week. And that's how they basically stole the sewing machine market. Um, a manufacturer is basically just a manufactured item, such as a plastic cup, a keychain, a boat anchor, a bowling ball, or more complex things like fabric. And then the composition of matter is, um, is essentially a chemical structure of some kind. So clearly a drug, you can have a patent on a particular drug. Uh, Kevlar, which is the ultra strong polymer used in bulletproof vests, is also a composition of matter. Uh, nylon was uh, once patented as a composition of matter. Um, you can have a patent on foods. So you could have, I don't know if they ever had one, but you could have a patent on Twinkies. Um, you could have a patent on gasoline formulations and uh, things like hairspray, cosmetics. These all are compositions of matter. Um, there are some things that the Supreme Court says are not patentable. Um, uh, one of them being laws of nature. Uh, so you can't patent, Einstein could not have patented E equals MC squared, and no, you couldn't patent gravity um, uh, for obvious reasons. It would be uh, to co opt an entire concept uh, from all of mankind. Physical phenomena can't be patented, such as the melting temperature of iron. Uh, these may be important discoveries, um, but they can't be patented because they're facts of nature. And you also can't patent abstract ideas, uh, such as mental processes, uh, ways of thinking about things, or, or mere mathematical algorithms although that has some important implications in patenting of computer inventions, and we'll come to that in a few minutes. Um, there was a very famous case, Diamond v. Chakrabarty, that came up to the Supreme Court in 1980, and the question was uh, whether living things were patentable. Chakrabarty had de developed some genetically engineered bacteria that could digest oil spills, and um, he filed a patent application, and the patent office rejected it because they said, well, uh, we're rejecting it because it claims a living thing, and living things are not patentable subject matter. Well, ultimately, uh, the Supreme Court disagreed. And uh, reading the opinion is very interesting. It's clear that the, the Supreme Court learned a whole lot about biotechnology. They, they described what DNA was and how the genetic engineering had been done. Uh, and ultimately, they said, well, bacteria are patentable, as is anything under the sun that is made by man. And the important thing, it has to be made by man, not by nature. And since uh, Chakrabarty himself had, had changed the structure of this bacteria, it was eligible for patent protection. And then the question became, well, what about multicellular organisms? Could you patent animals? And ultimately, uh, Patent Commissioner Diamond at the time, he said, well, um, it was clear to him from reading of the Supreme Court's decision in, Di in the Chakrabarty case that the court would have the same view of multicellular organisms they did of single cell organisms. Um, but he said, but he would not, you could not patent humans. And the reason he cited was that the 13th Amendment to the Constitution has abolished slavery. 
Uh, there's another interesting case that's in contrast with what was held in, in Chakrabarty. And this case actually predated Chakrabarty by a long time. It was a case decided by the Supreme Court in 1948, Funk Brothers Seed Company versus Kalo. And the Funk Brothers had uh, obtained a patent on a mixture of nitrogen-fixing fixing bacteria uh, that could be used to inoculate legumes to uh, help them grow faster. And uh, in their patent, they explained that uh, most nitrogen-fixing bacteria would interfere with one another if they were combined, but they found three strains of bacteria that when combined, didn't interfere with one another, and they sold this as a mixed inoculum. Uh, the Supreme Court ultimately ruled that this non-inhibition between these naturally occurring bacteria was not an invention that was made by the hands of man, but it was something that was a fact of nature. And they said, like the heat of the sun, electricity, or the qualities of metals, it is part of the storehouse of knowledge of all men reserved exclusively to none very famous quote. Um, and so ultimately, um, a, if you go back to what Thomas Jefferson thought, this is a mere combination of naturally occurring substances. And um, the Supreme Court said that's not quite enough to constitute an invention. Well, what about computer software? Well, in the 1980s, there was a roaring debate about whether computer software could be patentable. And the uh, Patent and Trademark Office said no. Um, that's not patentable subject matter. Go down and see the Copyright Office and you get a copyright registration and that's the appropriate form of intellectual property protection. Which may be true for the literal code because copyrights protect uh, works of authorship, uh, but it wouldn't protect the underlying functionality of the computer code. And functionality is something that's protected by patents. There was a very serious discussion in Congress at the time that perhaps there ought to be a special kind of intellectual property protection for computer software that was neither copyright nor patent, but was something in between. Uh, but ultimately, uh, while that was being debated, a clever lawyer came along and said, well, he said, I've got this computer software, and I've got this general purpose computer, and when you use when you load the computer software into the general purpose computer, it becomes a special purpose computer, and I want to patent that special purpose computer. And uh, ultimately, um, ultimately the, the court said, uh, well, clearly machines are patentable, and we can't deny you the right to patent that special purpose machine. And so ultimately, that's how uh, computer software came to be patentable. Um, um, because machines clearly are patentable. Um, and then along comes a case that was very recent, just in June of 2010, Bilski v. Kapos, where Bilski sought to patent a business method for hedging energy costs. And energy costs go up and down, and they have certain seasonal variations, and they vary depending on how cold the winter is. And, um, and so it was basically a method of how you would could buy and sell energy commodities in a way that would allow you to uh, profit from increases or decreases. And um, many on the Supreme Court wanted to strike down all such business method patents and felt that uh, patenting of business methods just made no sense. It was going to be a real impediment to uh, free commerce. But ultimately, the majority uh, held that um, the Patent Act had no such exclusion uh, uh, for business method patents, but that Congress, of course, would be free to add one if they wish by changing the laws, which, of course, they haven't done. Uh, but in this case, they ruled that the hedging patent that Bilski was sought really sought to patent the general concept of hedging, which they said is really an abstract idea, and indeed it's taught in most uh, introductory uh, business courses uh, how to hedge bets on, on the marketplace, and that it was not patentable because of that. And so the Bilski didn't get their patent, didn't get his patent, but um, the court did affirm that business methods are patentable. Uh, what's that? Could not argue that in this case it would be a process? 
Uh, yeah, well, there, there's a whole line of cases that, uh, that address what it takes to, uh, um, to rise to the level of being patentable subject matter. And I think that if they had, just, if they had claimed a computer system for, making, uh, for hedging bets in, in the energy market, they would have had a much better chance because, again, they would be patenting a system that involves some computer machinery and other things, and that would have been more likely to have passed muster. But one of the things the court pointed out is that everything that was uh, in uh, Bilski's claims could be, could be done in your head or could be done on pencil and paper, uh, and it would essentially co-opt the entire idea of hedging uh, for all possible ways of using it. And that's why they said it was merely an abstract idea. A utility. Uh, this is one of the things about the utility requirement is it pretty quickly gets rid of the perpetual motion machines. Here's a, a picture of one where it's a, a siphon that siphons into itself and continuously flows. Of course, the, uh, the, the error here is that in order for a siphon to work, you have to have the hose. Uh, uh, yeah, generally you have to have, well, I don't know if that might, uh, it won't work. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> there's something about it that's, <laughs> I welcome you to try it, but I don't think it'll work. <laughs> um, anyway, the utility requirement is usually the easiest one to, uh, to satisfy. And, uh, but in the early days of biotechnology, it became a real problem because people wanted to claim a method of treating uh, disease in a human patient, and they were coming to the patent office only with animal data, or sometimes only with in vitro data, and the Supreme Court would say, or the, uh, the patent office would say, no, um, this, this, is, this utility is, this is not really a utility because you haven't shown that it actually would work in humans. Come back when you have some human data. Well, the problem is, in the biotech industry, which was largely uh, funded by the venture capital community. If you started a company to develop um, biotechnology drugs, it would cost you millions of dollars to collect human data, but you couldn't get an investor to give you millions of dollars to do that research un unless you had a patent. And so these companies were all stuck. And ultimately, the patent commissioner at the time uh, uh, stepped in and said, look, all you've got to do is provide a plausible utility. And um, the, uh, then if the examiner has some proof that the, your, your claimed utility doesn't work, then you would have to provide some evidence that it does work. But the patent examiner can't say that it won't work because you haven't proven it in humans. Um, they would have to have some publication uh, somewhere that suggested that that would be inoperable. And so that kind of opened the doors for the development of the biotechnology industry. Um, it was an interesting case. Uh, actually, it was an invention by a uh, professor. Uh, the case came before the Supreme Court in 1966. Uh, Manson had invented a process for making a number of uh, steroid derivatives, really a whole class of steroid derivatives. and. Uh, in his patent application, he said, well, so there were some similar steroid compounds that had been found to have uh, anti-tumor activity. And he said, uh, these compounds that I've uh, described and that I've, my patent application explains how to make uh, would be good to uh, screening targets for identifying further cancer drugs. And the Supreme Court said uh, that that is not enough, that it's not enough to say that You've got an invention that produces chemicals that are uh, useful for further study because useful for further study is not really a use that has a practical benefit. And uh, that you have to have a specific benefit, practical benefit, in currently available form described in your application. Um, otherwise, there's insufficient justification for a mon monopoly on what may prove to be a broad field. This. Uh, this harks back to uh, a long-standing view of the patent system as being a bargain between the inventor and, and the government, where the government will give them a, 
a limited in time monopoly on a particular technology in exchange for the inventor's willingness to tell the world about the invention and how it works rather than keep it secret. And I said, well, without offering any benefit to man, and, and the benefit to mankind in generally is once the patent expires, then that invention will be known and will be free to all. And here they said there's just not enough uh, in, to justify the granting of a monopoly. Um, the uh, next requirement for patentability is your invention must be novel. Uh, this is described under 35 USC 102. And um, it's, it, it's a little bit complicated, but I think it's worthwhile to uh, look at it in detail. Uh, you can get a patent unless it was already known or used by others in the United States. So if somebody else already made, had your idea um, and they can prove it, then they would be entitled to the patent, um, which is changing in the new law where whoever gets to the patent office first will get the patent. Um, or if it was patented or described in a printed publication anywhere in the world before you invented it. So if you make an invention and then you later discover that somebody invented it 20 years ago in France, then you are not entitled to the patent because you weren't the first to invent. Uh, also, um, you're entitled to a patent unless it was patented or described in a printed publication anywhere in the world uh, more than a year before you file your patent application. And so printed publications and patents that were, were made public more than a year before you file your patent application is called the prior art. And uh, we'll see that's also important for the next requirement. Um, there's also a requirement here that uh, you can't get a patent if it's been in public use or on sale uh, in this country more than a year prior to your filing of a patent application. And today, people offer things for sale on the internet, which makes them instantly available for sale in the United States. Um, what's a publication then for, for purposes of patent applications? You know, we're saying that if, you, if you're worried about someone having invented it before you did, what do you look at? And uh, if you're worried about someone having uh, put it into a printed publication or patent more than a year before your filing date, which is 102B, then uh, what do you look at? Well, uh, it includes, of course, scientific publications, but it also includes advertisements and sales brochures which might not be things that you normally think of as printed publications. As I pointed out, the uh, uh, Nabisco uh, versus General Foods case over the soft batch cookies, uh, the patent was ultimately found invalid because of a, a German language cookbook printed in 1948. Uh, there can be a publication or an abstract that has one sentence that describes your invention. And uh, if it describes it in, uh, sufficient detail that with what a person who might read it would ordinarily know, um, the so-called person of ordinary skill in the art, which in the case of, uh, of um, biology would somebody, be somebody who had experience in biology. If you describe a, so let's say you describe a protein and you provide its molecular weight um, and what tissue it's in, then one of ordinary skill in the art could go find that protein. Uh, so that uh, an abstract can be enough. I was involved in a lawsuit once where uh, the inventors had published an abstract more than a year before their filing date, but luckily it turned out they had put down the wrong molecular weight. The graduate student who did the experiment uh, picked up the wrong standard and, and had cited the molecular weight as being 140,000 Daltons when in fact it was 75,000 Daltons. And, and the uh, judge ultimately ruled that one of ordinary skill in the art would have never found this protein because it would have been looking for something too big. Um, your own publications that uh, uh, you published more than a year ago will be cited against you as prior art. And so um, you always have to be cautious about what you have published uh, on your own. 
Uh, these days, websites and web forums and the like uh, are important sources of prior art. So, uh, and even though you may think you're putting something just on your Salk website, you'd be amazed at how fast the Google web crawler will pick that up and catalog it. So, then, and at which point it becomes a publication. Um, if a graduate student completes their PhD and um, Usually they're required to take their thesis to the library and the library then puts it in the card catalog. Even though there's no evidence that anybody ever looked at it, that it becomes prior art against you in a year. Uh, and so most libraries have a process where if you have an invention that's described in your, in your um, thesis, the librarian will hold it in a special collection that is released only upon your approval. Uh, for a period of up to a year in order to make sure you have time to file your patent applications. And uh, <clears throat> here's one that surprises many people. An NIH grant application um, is confidential when it goes through the peer review process. But once the, um, once the NIH grants your, uh, awards your grant, they send you the notice of award, now anyone in the public can file a request under the Freedom of Information Act and obtain a copy of your grant application. And so from the time the notice of award issues, it's considered prior art. <clears throat> yeah? Uh, I, would, I would think that uh, in, in a very close field, they'll know exactly who in academia are working on things that they're interested in. And uh, I would not at all be surprised that they're they're not looking for those things. Hopefully, they're seeing them first in your patent applications. So um, we talked about this public use. If the invention is in public use more than a year before you file your patent application, um, then, um, then it's not patentable. Well, um, in the case Egbert v. Lippmann in 1881, um, it had to do with corset stays. Uh, Barnes had invented a double layer metal corset stay, spring. At the time, corset stays were all made from, from bone of some kind. And uh, Barnes made some of these uh, and uh, gave them to his wife, and she really liked them, and she wore them for quite a long time. And in fact, she, they admit that she wore out her corset and uh, then took them out and put them into a new corset. So she wore them for quite a while and really liked them. And ultimately, she convinced Barnes to file a patent application. Well, um, of course, you say, well, how's that public use? Nobody could see the corset stays. First of all, they couldn't see the corset. But even if they did, they can't see the stays inside the little sleeve in the corset. So how can that be public use? Well, the court said, if an invention is used without limitation or restriction or any requirement of secrecy, then it's public use, even though use and knowledge of the use may be confined, confined to one person. So what it really comes down to is if someone is using it for its intended purpose, then it's, on, it's in public use. On the other hand, if they are using it in experiments, they're testing it to see if it could be improved, then that wouldn't be public use. That, that would be, uh, especially if there was, uh, they told the tester to make sure they kept it secret, and they went and collected data to give evidence that they had actually um, been using it in testing. The um, uh, non-obviousness non is the fourth requirement for patentability. Uh, uh, the picture uh, you can see is a combination of a tricycle and a, and a push lawn lawnmower. And uh, so the question is, well, you know, tricycles were known and push lawnmowers were known. Is it obvious to combine the two into a single machine? And uh, that's what 103A is all about. It says, a patent may not be obtained if the differences between the claimed invention and the prior art are such that the claimed invention as a whole would have been obvious before the filing date of the patent um, to a person having ordinary skill in the art to which the claimed invention pertains. So if someone who is of ordinary skill in the lawnmower business 
And um, you know, they certainly knew that bicycles exist, and they certainly knew that these kinds of push mowers exist. Uh, would it have been obvious to them that you could combine the two into making this device? Um, these are the kind. Of, these are the cases. This question of obviousness is really the battleground between the patent office and the and inventors uh, around the world. And the Supreme Court in 2007 took a look at obviousness again. Uh, there are many cases in the Supreme Court that dealt with obviousness. But in this case, uh, it was an, about an invention that was a combination of known elements. And uh, you can see this is a, um, an adjustable, it's a, uh, brake, a gas pedal that has an adjustable mechanism. A lot of cars today have those where you can move the gas pedal up or down. When you push on the gas pedal, it has the same effect. And um, the, it was also, of course, back in, uh, in the old days, there would be a cable that came out of here so that when you push on the gas pedal, it pulls on the cable and that operates the throttle. Well, when uh, electronic controls for engines came along, computerized controls, um, there were gas pedals developed that had an electronic sensor instead of a cable. And so the invention in KSRV Teleflex was essentially if you took this device and put an electronic sensor on it to sense the position of the gas pedal instead of using a cable. And um, the court said, well, when we think about the person of ordinary skill, they're also a person of ordinary creativity. They're not an automaton. And a person of ordinary skill in this case, they said, would be uh, a, an automotive engineer who might be assigned the task of combining a, 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 an adjustable gas pedal with an electronic sensor. And um, the court pointed out that on this device, there are only certain places that you could put this electronic sensor. You could put it up here, you could put it over there, uh, you might put it here, or you could put it on the axis of rotation of when you push on the gas pedal. And so they said, they said there were really only five places you could put it. And they said that ultimately, in deciding where to put it, one of the questions is, would you have to have a dangling wire that would be moving back and forth every time you pushed on the gas pedal? Well, the only place you could put it where there would be no dangling wire would be here on the, the axis of rotation, because this piece doesn't move. And so you could simply have uh, the sensor there. And ultimately, that was what was claimed in this patent. Uh, so the, the court said, when there's a market pressure to solve a problem and a finite number of predictable solutions, if one of these leads to success, it's likely the product of ordinary skill and common sense. Um, the, um, on a more technical level, this case was about what was the test for patentability, or I mean, the test for uh, whether something was obvious, and the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which is the appellate court in all patent cases, they had said, well, it's not obvious unless there's a teaching, suggestion, or motivation in prior writings that would lead one to uh, develop the invention claimed. And they found no teaching, suggestion, or motivation for where to place the um, where to place the electronic sensor, and the Supreme Court said that test is not really the test of obviousness. It's really got to, you got to engage the brain a little more than just looking at those particular words. Now, novelty and obviousness can be easy to confuse. <clears throat> so um, I think it's helpful to point out what the differences are. So novelty is basically whether something has ever been invented before. So in order for something to lack novelty, there would have to be one reference, one article, one printed publication, one abstract, that standing alone would teach one of ordinary skill in the art how to carry out your invention. And so basically, uh, one of the things, the words that patent lawyers use to describe it is, uh, uh, lack of novelty, there's a a, a reference that anticipates the invention. Uh, there's an, a, another reference, a, an article somewhere or a patent somewhere that had already described the same invention 
in all of its important features. And um, there are two ways you can have lack of novelty. One is if there's a question about whether you're the first inventor, if someone, um, <clears throat> if someone actually had conceived the invention before you did, then uh, you didn't invent it. You weren't the first inventor and you don't get the patent and there's really no time limit on that. When it comes to printed publications that might describe your invention, the only publications that count are publications that were filed more than one year or that were published more than one year before you applied for your patent. This is not so, by the way, anywhere else in the world but the United States. Everywhere else in the world, um, there's no one-year grace period from these uh, prior art references. As soon as somebody publishes it, it becomes uh, a bar to patentability for you. Uh, obviousness, on the other hand, <clears throat> can't really be done. Uh, it, it, but most often, it requires the combination of two or more references that were published more than a year ago. So they might, the examiner might point to a publication that you yourself made a year and a half ago and another publication that was made three years ago and they would say one of ordinary skill in the art having read your prior art publication and this older prior art publication would naturally combine the two without the use of any inventive faculties and arrive at your invention so it's obvious. Um, but what KSRB Teleflex said was, well, you know, it can be one or more reference uh, and the application of common sense. You don't have to go too far to figure out. Um, so there may be things that are so commonly known by biologists that looking at, at your reference and combining it with, with ordinary knowledge in the field is, is enough to render it obvious. And then the uh, final requirement for patentability is uh, you have to provide an adequate written description and you have to provide enablement of the invention. So the specification is basically the written description part. It has to contain <clears throat> a written description of the invention and the manner and process of making and using it in such full, clear, concise, and exact terms as to enable one uh, any person skilled in the art to which it pertains or to which it is mo with which it is most nearly connected to make and use same. So somebody has to be able to read your patent and just using your patent along with ordinary skill in the field be able to carry out your invention. And if you don't provide enough information for that, then your patent application will be rejected for lack of enablement. Um, uh, but it's also important to note that the requirement for the written description and the requirement for enablement are actually two separate things. Uh, and um, uh, the courts have said the purpose of the written description is broader than merely to explain how to make and use the invention, but it also has to explain the context surrounding it, has to explain uh, what are some alternatives uh, of course, has to describe the utility and has to describe the invention broadly so that uh, one reading the application could not only make the invention but would have some idea of, uh, of the breadth of the, of the invention and how to make it in all of that breadth. Um, the other thing important to keep in mind is that for enablement, uh, a poor example of the invention is enough. You just have to prove the concept. Um, the Manual of Patent Examining Procedures, which is kind of the Bible that patent examiners use in examining patents, says it is not necessary to enable one of ordinary skill in the art to make and use a perfected, commercially viable embodiment. It could be, in fact, a, a very um, weak example, but simply enough to prove the concept. So, uh, to uh, sum up, your invention is patentable if it contains, it's directed to patentable subject matter, it has utility, it's novel, it's non-obvious, and it can be described in a writing, and that writing would enable one, others in your field to make and use the invention. Um, but you don't have to rack your brain trying to decide whether your invention is patentable or not. 
Really, all you got to do is give us a call because we actually love this stuff, and we're happy to help you walk through that analysis. Thank you very much. We've got um, plenty of time for comments, questions. Um. What's that? Yeah, novelty. Yeah, well, novelty, keep in mind, novelty has to be, uh, it really has to describe in one reference the same invention. So even if there are small differences, then it's not going, um, um, it's not going to be an issue of novelty. If there, if there are trivial differences, then it might be obvious because one of ordinary skill in the art would say, well, you could take that virus and you could change it this way, and everybody knows that. Um, so, <clears throat> very often, um, you do get rejections of patent applications based on novelty, but uh, the more difficult ones are the ones where the patent office says it's obvious. And uh, for one thing, it's, it's kind of a, a matter of perspective is involved. And, uh, and ultimately, um, diff opinions can differ on what one of ordinary skill in the art, art might or might not. Uh, be naturally drawn to. And at the end of the day, it winds up being a bit of a negotiation with the examiner on the wording of the patent and how broadly the patent, broad or narrow the patent would have to be for them to agree that it was, um, that it was not obvious. Okay. And so we buy one of these light bulbs, we're using it, and we think, hey, you know, this is, um, we can make a slight modification and have something better for our purposes. If we, make a, if we create a new light bulb, it's slightly different, maybe it's hotter, different wavelengths or something, is that an infringement um, if we're using it? Um, well, if you, if you bought the light bulb, if the light bulb had a patent on it, when you buy the article, the patent rights are said to be exhausted. So that once you buy a patented article, then you can use it however you like, and the patent no longer has any power over your use of it. But if you then, if you then created, uh, you said, well, let's just set this aside and build our own light bulb. The new light bulb you're building, <clears throat> if it has all of the patented features of the original light bulb, then your work to develop an improved light bulb, that would be considered uh, a commercial use. And even though you're in academia, it would still be considered a commercial use. And the mere act of building one would be an infringement. Um, now, one of the other things, though, is you could get a patent on your improved light bulb. And even though they have a patent on the basic light bulb, you could get a patent on the improved light bulb. You couldn't sell the improved light bulb without infringing the patent on the simple light bulb. But they couldn't sell the improved light bulb either because you have a patent on the improvement. And so ultimately, um, your, the best outcome for both parties is you grant them a license to use your invention to make, an improve, make and sell an improved light bulb, and then they pay you a royalty of a certain percentage of the sales of the new light bulb, and uh, everybody's happy, and the new invention gets out to the public. So, in the development of that new one, improved one, aren't you then using it? Is it that invention? Yeah, it would. If you if you use an invention uh, to create an improved invention, that use of the invention would be uh, an infringing act. The um, and now there. There is a, you would think, well, isn't there a, some kind of a research exemption? Well, there really isn't. Uh, and people in academia very often think that, well, since I'm doing 
academic research, it doesn't matter whether there's any patents out there. And uh, this, the court has quite clearly said that's not true. There is a tiny exemption uh, the, that falls under the, the judge-made doctrine of de minimis non curat lex, which is Latin for the law is not here to solve minuscule problems. And so if you carry out, you, you get a patent, you say, I think I'll build one of these and see if it works the way they describe it, um, that's considered a de minimis use and it's not going to be, uh, someone can't sue you for infringement. Um, but you're, or, or if you just say, I don't have anything to do today, I think I'll build this invention. There you're just satisfying your idle curiosity. And that again is, is not considered infringement. But if you use the invention to make an improved invention, the courts have said, no, that's a commercial use, and that would be an infringement. There is an exception, however. Um, one of the big issues in pharmaceutical patenting was that the courts held that if you had a patented drug and there was a generic drug company that wanted to get FDA approval to sell that patented drug after your patent expires, they would need to do a lot of human clinical trials to prove that the drug they were making was biologically equivalent to the one that uh, the patent holder was selling. And there was a drug company, I think it was Bar Laboratories, they started doing these human clinical trials before the patent expired. They said, well, we're not selling any of this stuff yet. We're going to wait until the patent expires, but we want to get this testing done because otherwise it's going to take as many years after the patent expires to do that work. We want to be ready the day the patent expires. And the court said that's an infringement, that your use of that drug in those clinical trials clearly is a commercial use and it infringes the patent and um, you can't do it. Well, Congress was very upset by that and because what that meant was that when a patent on a drug expired, the generic equivalents would be delayed for two, three years at least. And uh, in the meantime, the, uh, meantime the, the companies that had patents on drugs were complaining about something that was affecting the life of their patents, and that was the FDA was so slow that you know your patent only lasts a certain amount of time. Well. When, if you're going through this FDA review process, if it takes them eight years to, uh, uh, to uh, approve your drug, well, you know, you've now lost eight years of your patent life. And they said, that's not fair. So Congress came out with what, one of the more clever pieces of legislation, um, which is called the Hatch-Waxman Act. And what it did was it married these two problems into a special solution. They said, we're going to make it so that if you are developing a drug for the purpose of seeking FDA approval, that anything you do with a patented drug that's ultimately with an intention to seek FDA approval, that's not going to be an infringement. So if generic drug companies want to start manufacturing and clinical testing before your, the patent on the drug expires, that's free game, they're allowed to do that. And so that way the generic drugs can hit the market the day the patent expires. In exchange, they said, well, we're also going to, for the people who have these drug patents, we're going to extend the term of your patent to make up for any inordinate delays in the FDA approval process. And so once somebody gets a, an approval for a, a FDA approval for a drug, uh, then they, um, they can apply for an extension to uh, compensate them for the delays involved, and they'll get, might get two to five years extra life tacked on to the end of their patent uh, to make up for that. So it's a great compromise. Uh, so if you're working on drugs or you're doing anything that has an ultimate goal of um, getting FDA approval, then you don't have to worry about patent infringement. In fact, it was a case that came up to the Supreme Court a few years ago uh, called Merck v. Integra. Uh, Merck had a patented drug, and Integra 
made some of that drug for the purposes of trying to come up with an improved drug, very much like your light bulb example. And so they, um, they made some derivatives of that drug, and then they used that drug in, in some testing side by side with these, with these uh, analogs in order to identify a drug that was better. <coughs> they ultimately got it patented and then went into competition with Merck for, in that market for the sale of this now improved drug. And uh, Merck sued them for infringement. And um, the Supreme Court said, well, this so-called safe harbor that allows you to use patented technologies before the patents expire if you're trying to get FDA approval of a drug, it doesn't have to be the same drug you're trying to get FDA approval of. In fact, they said, when we read this language, we read it very broadly. We think that Congress wanted to open the doors to the development of drugs uh, whether you're developing a generic equivalent of a patented drug or you're developing an improvement of a patented drug, to us it doesn't matter. Both are exempt from infringement liability. And as they often do, they say, uh, if Congress disagrees with our analysis, they can certainly very easily pass a law amending the patent statutes to, to limit it to only generic drugs. But of course they didn't. So when you're developing something that has a therapeutic product is an endpoint, uh, your fears about uh, patent infringement are, are very small. Yeah? Isn't there like a, a new development you have to negotiate first to patents instead of the old first in the bank to approve uh, patent in a notebook or something? Yeah. The, uh, the first to invent system is, was uniquely American. Um, and uh, our patent laws always said whoever conceives an invention first is entitled to the patent. <clears throat> and so if you file a patent application and the patent examiner discovers that somebody else has filed a patent application on the very same invention, then they would declare an interference between these two patent applications and they would say, well, <clears throat> whoever conceived it first is the one entitled to the invention, so show us your notebooks. And that's why <clears throat> You hear people saying you should get your notebook pages signed and witnessed, and that's what that was for. So you would have some independently verifiable proof that you were the, the and when you conceived the invention. Because the courts have said that the uncorroborated testimony of of the inventors is too self-serving to be relied upon. So, uh, but if you ha then if you can prove that you had the earlier conception date, then the next question is. Were you diligent in reducing the invention to practice from the time of conception up until that you actually were able to show that it works uh, and, and then filed your patent application in a reasonable time thereafter? Uh, there was a famous case, um, I can't remember the name of it offhand, that had to do with uh, in, in such an interference where one of the inventors was a professor. And he had the, clearly conceived the invention earlier, and he had proof of that. But he said, well, um, I was working on the invention, but then my student graduated, and my new graduate student didn't start until September. And so um, we couldn't work on it until the new graduate student got here. And when the new graduate student got here, we continued working on it. And the Supreme Court admonished the professor and said, you know, patents are part of the commercial world, and if you want to play in this world, you have to play by commercial rules. And you don't get three months off because you're waiting for your graduate student to show up. Diligent reduction to practice means you've got to be diligent. And there's no reason why you couldn't have picked up a, a test tube yourself and continued working on the invention during that three-month period. So they ruled that he had abandoned the invention that his early conception date was useless, that his conception date was now in September when he resumed work on the invention, and he lost the patent. Um, but these contests, uh, I've, I've been doing university tech transfer for over 20 years, and I've only seen about three of these interferences come up. Usually they're between academic institutions. It can be interesting. Uh, usually they're settled uh, without having to go through the extensive process and they basically agree to share the, uh, the revenues from the invention. 
But the rest of the world has always worked on this first to file system where whoever gets to the patent office with a patent application first, they get the patent. I call it the race to the patent office. And uh, the US has resisted the first to file system uh, for, well, uh, there was a big effort to harmonize uh, the patent statutes uh, that started some 30 years ago. And the big obstacle to patent harmonization was always the US insistence on two things. One was this first to invent system, and the other was the one year grace period from publications. And uh, so the new Patent Act finally uh, succumbs to the first to file system. As a practical matter, we all live under that system anyway because markets today are global. And so when you're filing a patent application, you're most often filing an international application that ultimately allows you to get patents around the world. And since the rest of the world has the race to the patent office, then you're always getting to the US patent office pretty early as well. So I think uh, it's not going to have a big impact. The people who will be mostly impacted are the uh, backyard inventors who may not have the resources to run out and patent things so easily. There are a number of other changes uh, in the procedures in the law, um, some of which are, I think will be helpful, kind of streamline the process a little bit. But then they also made some changes to some of the statutes that I showed you today, many of which won't come into effect for a year or so. Um, but nobody knows what the new language that Congress has put into these statutes is really going to mean. Um, for example, it says um, uh, pri the prior art is not only patents and printed publications, but also uh, information otherwise made accessible. What does that mean? Does that, I, I presume it would, they're talking about things like electronic communications, the internet, uh, things like that, tweets, and, you know, whatever. But um, what about oral publications? If somebody gives a talk in the US, if you give a talk about your invention, uh, that is not considered a publication unless you hand out an abstract or hand out slides because um, prior art is only written publications. Um, so, uh, whereas in Europe, if you give a talk, even if you give a talk uh, uh, at a conference in the US, from the moment the words come out of your mouth, your invention is no longer patentable anywhere in the world except the United States because all other countries recognize oral uh, presentations as publications as well. Yes? Uh, how many patents that subject should have and uh, how, or what percentage of them are being invented? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think that there are over 300. Is anybody? Uh, what's that? Patent portfolio 723. Okay. Uh, some, some are licensed to pharmaceutical companies. Um, I think that one of the big challenges uh, for us is a lot of the inventions that are made at the Salk Institute are so early that they don't actually have any drugs. They really basically have identified a me mechanism or a target for drug screening. And the problem you may find a really valuable new target for drug screening. You found an enzyme that's involved in diabetes that wasn't known before. Um, the problem is if you don't have any, any chemicals that you can show affect that enzyme, then the only invention you've got is a method of screening for drugs. And the problem is your patent application will be published 18 months after you file the application but your patent probably won't issue for three to five years. And 
of course, you're going to make academic publications about this discovery as well. Well, when, um, when industry can find out about your, your new target and you haven't got a patent yet, there's nothing to stop them from screening for drugs using your invention up until the day your patent issues and they won't have an infringement liability and they may be finished with their screening by then. So it's hard to make, it's hard to uh, generate revenue or, you know, on the other side, it's hard to encourage, hard to incentivize companies to develop drugs if you can't offer uh, some kind of patent protection that will ultimately protect the final product. And so we're looking now at ways to uh, to collaborate with other institutions that have high throughput screening programs, for example, so that when we identify a new target, we can do our own high throughput screening. We can find a few candidates, uh, potential drug candidates, <clears throat> and then we could either get composition of matter patents on those compounds and, and related compounds as drugs, or we get patents on a method of treating a disease, <coughs> treating diabetes by <coughs> administering a therapeutically effective amount of an inhibitor of enzyme X. But you've got to have some actual examples of, of an inhibitor before you can make such a claim. And then those would provide, when licensed to an industry, to a company, would give them market exclusivity to develop drugs that act in that way. And one of the reasons that we're giving all these talks is to encourage people to think about <clears throat> what, what, what experiment can I do that will take it to the next step in terms of um, commercial value and uh, an incentive for industry to bring this to the patient bedside. So we strongly encourage you to think about if you're, if you're looking at new biochemical mechanisms that are involved in disease, think about how you could use that to treat the disease. And uh, sometimes there are, there are some known inhibitors that you can use, and um, they may not be very specific, but they'll demonstrate the principle, and that's really all you need to get those kinds of patents. We have a number of other inventions that are <coughs> um, uh, methods of, uh, for example, um, uh, Jeff Wall invented uh, the FLIP method for ins doing uh, gene insertions, for specific gene insertions, and that has become extremely uh, valuable. We've licensed it to a great many companies that use it in their internal research and also to companies that sell genetically engineered mice to cell lines. So new techniques can be important. Of course, the patent on PCR was extremely valuable. So the more, the more unique and, uh, and critical the technology you develop is, uh, the more value there is. Any other questions? Okay, well then, uh, please join us for lunch outside. Thank you.